Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to the Hanging on to Hope podcast. I'm Brenda J. And I'm Karen Wonder. And we are HangingOnToHope.org. This podcast is intended as educational and is not psychological or medical advice. Always consult a professional when needed, and we disclaim any liability in connection with the instruction, information, or advice given. Thanks for tuning in to the Hanging On to Hope podcast. Oh, hey, hey, wait, Karen. All right. I decided to let you do this intro, even though we fought over the Gregoire's intro last time, <laughs> because... You had clearly communicated on that one podcast. Which one was that? That was the one about the love and respect book, but it's not about genuine respect. (laughs) Karen communicated that her favorite topics were... My favorite three topics. Her favorite three topics were the Bible, (laughs) hope, and sex. (laughs) We talked about you a little bit at the end, and I said, we're going to leave the sex podcast to the Gregoires. (laughs) They got that down. I said, but we'll do one once in a while. So, I'm sorry. Hold on a second. Did you? Yes. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. If the Bible, hope, and sex are her favorite topics. So I'm just going to let her go with it. And, uh, let's go ahead. All right. I'm, uh, I'm giving this one to her. All right. She's letting me do the intro because of that. So <laughs> let me do it again. Oh, my goodness. So welcome back to our podcast, Sheila Ware Gregoire. <laughs> yes. Thank you for having me. So you've become known as the Christian sex lady that you're an award-winning author, speaker, and host of the Bear Marriage Podcast, which is a great podcast. We're going to be talking about your newest book, The Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex. This podcast is for those who are married or who are wanting to be married, or in my case, hoping to be remarried someday. So welcome to the show. Thank you. Continuing with part two with Sheila Ray Gregoire. And I think learning that message that that is what God meant for women, for it to be intimate, mutual, and pleasurable for both can be so healing for women coming out of destructive marriages. Because if you've been in a marriage where sex has been coerced, where you have felt objectified, it can almost feel like God was your pimp. Mm. Because mm-hmm. you feel like God was telling you, you have to do this. Mm-hmm. He needs this. This is your job. Right. And so you don't matter. And understanding that, no, wait, that was never the way it was supposed to be. Right. <laughs> that can actually be a very healing thing, I think. Yeah. And that's why I think it's important to talk about because, again, to me, it's like God gets misrepresented in that message. Mm-hmm. That just touched something so profoundly in me right there, what you just said, because I did not feel like I married, I mattered at all in that marriage Mm -hmm. at all. Like, yeah, it's just, that just hit me hard. And I think as women, we, we can't, I think men are easier to, you know, decompartmentalize, you know, like if you're having problems in the marriage, your sex, their sex life doesn't matter. But as women, that's a lot more difficult. And I think that's where a lot of the pain comes in and abusive relationships or destructive relationships is we can't decompartmentalize if we're having problems and issues. I mean, plus just, it just overall, it just affects the women, you know, in a deeper level. So it's more of a painful, emotional, painful thing. Yeah. And it's not that I didn't, that I feel like I didn't matter. I actually didn't matter. That's, that's what makes it hard. Yeah. 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 Can can I just comment on that compartmentalization thing too? Yeah. Yeah. There's a, a misconception that men are able to compartmentalize better than women. That's not actually the case. When, they, when they've done a lot of studies, what they find is that women and men are both equally bad at multitasking. It's just that women have more practice at it because we have to do it. Yes. Um, and so the reason that women are less compartmentalized is because we have to be. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because we're looking after the kids. We've got to get the laundry on while the dinner's on. And we have to remember that so-and-so needs their homework done. And all of this stuff is on our shoulders. Right. But then what also happens is we have so many, and this happens to men, especially it's not only men because women can have this happen too, but where boys, when they're little are not really given words or the ability to talk through or identify their emotions. 
And so the only emotions they're allowed to have are happy or angry. Mm -hmm. And they don't know how to feel when it's sad or when it's rejected or when it's fearful, that really bothers them because they can't process that emotion because they were never taught. And so what men often do is they channel their emotions into sex. Hmm, that's interesting. Because sex allows them to feel connected without having to do the work of connecting. Mm, mm. Very interesting. Because w- in order to truly connect, you have to become vulnerable. Yeah. Right. In order to become vulnerable, you have to get in touch with your emotions. Right. And that's something that many men, especially with, you know, avoidant attachment styles or with some, with, with, with abuse in their past or whatever it might be, just aren't able or willing to do. Mm -hmm. And so we get into these marriages where he basically is using her and she feels used. (laughs) Yeah. And it's easy for us to talk about, well, well, that's just the way men are, but no, it's not like this. That was never God's design either. Yeah, that's that, that's you know, yeah. that again is how these things have gotten perpetuated through really dysfunctional ways of raising kids, through dysfunctional ways of relating to one another. And the good news is I think we can break that cycle in yes. future generations if we start to get this right. Yes. That's great. That's why your work is important. Yeah. Cause I always thought that that's just how men were. Right. So now you just kind of Corrected that, us on that. that. Out of the That's water. wonderful. I did too. And then my daughter, who's a psych grad, started getting mad at me when I was saying that on my podcast. And she's like, you know, that's not true, mom, right? And I'm like, of course it is. She's like, no, it's not. And then she started showing me all these studies. And I'm like, oh, okay. Oh, that that, <laughs> it gives me hope. I know. It, it really does. Definitely more hopeful outlook. Than- it really, really gives, <laughs> gives me much more hope because I had given up before this podcast. I had given up. You just gave Brenda a new life. I had given up completely. <laughs> But anyway, now I have it. You are awesome. Okay. One one aspect of women enjoying sex with her husband is the wife allowing herself to be served. You say they have to stop always thinking about everyone else and concentrate and allow themselves to be served. And that expressing love during sex is the key to women's sexual response. Why is that so important? Yeah, this is kind of a funny thing. Okay. Think about where God put the clitoris. All right, we're going to get kind of explicit here, but this will be fun. Karen, <laughs> her face. <laughs> okay, it's going to get worse, Karen. So just, just, just strap on your big girl panties here. Okay? No, right. she, she got so excited. <laughs> so, so God did not stick the clitoris up the vagina so that it would get maximum stimulation during intercourse. Okay, he put the clitoris outside and on front. And most women who reach orgasm, do not do so through intercourse alone. Most women need a lot of foreplay and most women who do reach orgasm reliably find that there are other routes to orgasm that are easier for them. Now that doesn't mean intercourse can't feel good. Okay. I have a whole course, an orgasm course on, on orgasm, and it includes a module on how to feel good during intercourse. So I'm not trying to say intercourse can't feel good. I'm just saying that there are other routes that tend to be more reliable. And that's pretty much true across all cultures for women. Mm -hmm. So while intercourse might be super easy for men, (laughs) you know, in order for them to reach climax, it isn't for women. And I think that's because women are supposed to be served by men. If women are going to reach orgasm, he has to pay attention to her. He has to slow down. (laughs) He has to become, he he has to do things to her. And uh, I mean, guys can tend to reach orgasm in about three minutes. Women take a lot longer. Now, most guys hopefully can take longer too, but if they didn't need to take longer, (laughs) you know, and I I think that tells us something, which is, this is a time when women are supposed to not have to worry about someone else, but they honestly just get to be served. Mm -hmm. That's great. (laughs) So you say it, you kind of already talked about this, but I'm going to talk about this again, because I love how you you brought up that verse. So in Genesis 4, 1, it says, Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived. And it's the same word used in my favorite Psalm 139 that says, David said, search me, God, and know my heart, test me and know my anxious thoughts. It's an intimate knowing, not a one night stand. Now, before I was a Christian, I definitely had a promiscuous past. I had one night stands where alcohol was involved mostly. And I would have shame in the morning, even then, and feeling used. And the movies and the media definitely portray a great sex life in those situations, you know, where they just meet and have this wonderful sex, you know, they just met five minutes ago, you know, and we know that there is a spiritual aspect to sex. And I love a quote from your book. It says, 
Sex is ultimately a longing, a passion, a deep desire for connection with him, and he made us long for each other in the same way to mirror how he feels about us. Can you expound on how the spiritual aspect is such a part of God's idea for sex? Yeah, I mean, think about how God uses sexual imagery to talk about his relationship with us. It's all throughout scripture. Even the fact that Jesus is the bridegroom and the church is the bride and there's a wedding banquet in heaven. Like that's all about consummation. Okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and and Song of Solomon can be read as an allegory about how God feels about us too. You know, it's got those two different ways of reading it, the, the literal one and the allegorical one. And I think that in a way, when God made sex, and then when he talks about that as a, um, as how he feels about us, it's to give us this word picture of how much he longs to be connected with us. And that connection isn't just intellectual. It isn't just emotional. It's, it's everything about us. It's our whole being. And that's what sex is supposed to be. It's our whole being. It isn't just our bodies, but it is our bodies. Mm-hmm. It isn't just our emotions, but it is our emotions. Yeah. You know, it isn't yeah. just our spirit, but it is our spirit. It's everything all together where you feel like you're truly one. And that is something where real passion with God flows from being able to be a little bit out of control. You know, you, you, you let him take over, Yeah, um, you're yes. caught up in joy and ecstasy with Jesus. And it's the same thing with sex. In order to experience real passion, we need to give up a level of control. You know, we need to let sex come over us. And I'm not talking about weird BDSM stuff. I don't mean that. I just mean that we're, we're not trying to force a feeling. We're allowing ourselves to experience Uh, And because that is the key to passion for women. And that only happens when we're able to be really vulnerable, Mm. you know, when we're able to really open up, because if you're not able to be vulnerable, then you're always going to be closed off, which means you're always going to have to stay a bit in control. Mm. So it's only when we can totally be who we were meant to be and not worried about things that real passion takes over. So that's, that's why sex in a committed, healthy relationship is totally different than anything else, because it's only in that committed, healthy relationship that you can be truly vulnerable because you can't be truly vulnerable if you can't trust your partner. Right. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Like when I think about the spiritual part to sex, it's hard for people that don't believe and don't have any spiritual side. I think there's, they're missing out so much. I don't know. That's always been a thought to me. Yeah, I I think so. I think what people can understand, though, is this idea that, you know, you really do feel like one. Yeah, Like we really do feel like, you know, when you look at each other's in the eyes where you really are completely vulnerable, that's something that most people can grasp, even if they've never experienced it. And that's something that people long for. And I think when you can begin to think about that in the sexual realm, you can often begin to think about how much that's what we really need too. That's yeah. what we were created for is that kind of connection. Yeah. And, and that's why even if you're in a position where sex isn't on the table right now, for whatever reason, <laughs> you know, that need to be able to be vulnerable and to be able to be really and truly known is still a need that we have. It just may not be expressed sexually. You know, it can be expressed with Jesus. Mm-hmm. It can be expressed within relationship where we do become vulnerable and open with one another, even if not in a sexual way, we can have deep, deep friendships. And we see that with Paul, you know, the deep friendship he shared with Timothy. Um, We see that with Jesus, you know, the way, the way that John talks about how he was the disciple that Jesus loved, right? (laughs) Like we see this deep vulnerability and connection. And I think it's important to remember that whether you're married or not, we were, we were created with that. Yes. And that's not a bad thing. And and in some, you know, we have a drive that has that met sexually, but we also have a drive. The, the, the real drive is for intimacy and connection, and that can be met in a variety of ways. Yeah. And God meant us to have that. Mm-hmm. You say in your book that obligation sex is the opposite of intimacy. I like how you word that instead of sex being something that unites you, it feels like something that erases you. This is so true in abusive relationships. You say that rejecting these harmful messages is the key to embracing your own sexuality. What advice would you give to anyone presently married in this situation? You don't have to consent to being used. You know, sex is supposed to be a knowing. It's not an owing. 
And if you feel at all like you can't say no, then you can't truly say yes either. And your relationship is never going to heal. It's never going to be healthy unless you're in a place where obligation isn't part of it. And sex becomes a way that you're truly expressing what you feel rather than a way that your body is being used. And, you know, I mean, don't do this if you're not safe. And if this wouldn't be safe to do, then you probably are in a position where you need to call a domestic violence hotline. But I think it's a completely a good idea. <laughs> to say to your spouse, I want to have a passionate, amazing sex life with you, but I am no longer willing to be used. Mm -hmm. And so until I can feel safe and until I know that sex is something that you want for me too, then I'm going to take it off the table. Yeah. And that's all right to do. You're not saying no to sex. You're just saying no to being used. Yeah, absolutely. In our last podcast with Leslie Vernick, actually towards the end of it, she goes over that too, how to say that and have a boundary in it. And of course, like she emphasized safety as well, because it really does depend on the dynamic of your relationship, but drawing that boundary is so important. So you give several tips for the wife that disconnects from her body during marital sex due to past trauma, those bound up in shame, et cetera. And I skimmed through some of those, some are a little bit steamy, so I didn't want to get into those too much. But I wanted to encourage a wife or husband that your book addresses these issues and some specifics to help. Can you share some tips for those that disconnect from their bodies? You know, there's a lot that we can do even outside the bedroom to help ourselves connect more with our bodies, even just stretching, you know, yoga, anything that we can do to feel what our bodies feel. The nice thing about stretching and yoga is you kind of have to lean into things like your body tells you whether you're supposed to go more or less or pull back or do more. And that's the kind of feedback that you want if you're also going to get sexually aroused. (laughs) Like you need to be able to listen to where your body's at and what your body wants. So the more we can learn it outside of the realm of sexuality, the easier it is to deal with it when it is sexual. That's good Mm. advice. That's really good. Yeah. And I'm, I'm I just finished doing so as release training for yoga, which is so much a part of that. It's that connection. It's the mind, you know, it's all three of them, the mind, body, soul. Mm-hmm. Connection. So it's all being, so if one of those is missing. Well, I did realize in my marriage that I had a, I had a complete disconnect with my body, like complete disconnect. So mm-hmm. I'm starting to stretch more and do, and I exercise more since I've been out of the marriage and stretch more and do the yoga. And now I do, I think about my body way more. So what you just said is absolutely 100% true. I really like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your survey found that 6.5% of men reported using porn on a regular basis daily or weekly. 16.7% have intermittent binges and another 26.5% use it rarely. You say, instead of honoring women as Amago Day, as whole people made in the image of God, Men who use porn can view their wives and even other women as objects or be consumed or objects they're entitled to use for their own gratification. You say you cannot build a healthy marriage until this is dealt with. This is predominant in abusive relationships as well. Do you want to expound on that? Yeah. So basically what we're looking at is, I think it's like 49 point, I don't know if it's six or seven or three. It's it's a lot. Okay. 49 point something percent of men are currently using porn in some way. Wow. You know, whether it's daily, weekly, intermittent, you know, binges where they go off a ton for a little bit and then they stop for a while, you know, or they're still using it rarely, but they're still using it. And the thing is, if someone's using porn, that isn't going to get better until they decide to stop. And they often don't stop until the pain of staying the same becomes greater than the pain of changing. And so unless like sometimes what it takes is ultimatums and like, I'm not going to accept that. Like you do not have to accept porn use in your marriage. You don't, right. You you can draw a boundary and you can say, this is something I'm not going to cross. And this just needs to change. Now there's good news and bad news. The good news is there are a lot of guys who did use porn in the past, but have stopped. I mean, we found a lifetime use of around 80%, just under 80%. So That's a lot of guys who did use it at some point, but now honestly don't. And when they have quit porn and they have quit the pornified style of relating, so they don't feel entitled to sex, they see sex as something mutual, their sex life and their marriage can be just about as good as if they'd never used porn before. So it is possible to stop. That's good news. Yeah, It's possible to stop. However, (laughs) that happens when people, when, when they do their own work. Right. And if someone is saying, 
you know, yes, I'm going to quit, but they don't let you see their phone and they're still being really secretive. That's not a sign that they've, that they're quitting or that they're committed to recovery. You know, recovery from porn isn't just about not watching porn. It's really about going into the reasons why porn got such a hold on them in the first place. Right. And often that is to do with, you know, emotional wounds that they're covering up. They're soothing themselves with pornography so they don't have to deal with their emotions, whatever it might be. And a guy who's truly working on recovery is going to be able to be vulnerable, to tell you what's going on. He's not going to see your questions as being intrusive. He's going to understand, you know, what's really happening. And if that isn't the case, then that is a sign that he's not really committed to recovery. So I, you know, I I think guys who are going to recover, they take the initiative. They don't need you to book the appointment. They don't need you to book, you know, to get controls on the computer. They don't need you to do those things. They will do them. And if they won't, that's a bad sign. Yeah. Yeah. And that's what Jay Stringer's book actually deals with too. He says that a lot of these, I mean, anyone that has any kind of sex addiction, he actually says it does go back to a lot of family issues that just need to be dealt with. So it's really interesting. Well, especially because, you know, for those of us who have sons, right. You think yeah. about how little so many boys are when they first see porn, mm-hmm. right. You know, 11, like 12, earlier and earlier. With yeah. Child, you know, often. And, and let's remember that showing a child pornography in many jurisdictions is actually a form of child abuse too. Like this is serious stuff. Yeah. And it can have such it, it, a lot of porn use as a teenager can actually grow out of trauma responses because so much porn is is very violent. And so I think we need to keep these lines of communication with our teenagers open and just tell them, you know, if you see something that you're horrified by, but you feel your body reacting to it, that doesn't mean you liked it. It doesn't mean you're a pervert. It doesn't mean that you're trapped now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, let's give them language to speak where they can understand that they may have been turned on, but that doesn't mean they're an addict. And, you know, it's possible to, to, to look away and to stop. Yeah. And I think it's also discovering a deep, deep understanding for that man or boy of why it's wrong, because Mm -hmm. I have an ex that still thinks it's fine and still explains to them that, no, this is fine. It's not fine. Because no, it goes so deep. It goes so deep. And so that's what I meant by that. Yeah. Yeah. You have to have that on those ongoing conversations. I have three boys. So I do, even though, you know, it's kind of embarrassing, but it's important to have these conversations and keep talking about it. So just to wrap it up, I love the work that you're doing. I'm really passionate about it. Yeah. It's deeply personal. And when we had you on last time, we t- when we talked about the great sex rescue, it definitely brought up some anger in me because I realized just how toxic and damaging so many of those books were that, that you you know, from your book and the surveys you did, you, you know, they just reaffirm that, that they're just so toxic. Yeah. And I just don't want anyone to have further damage done to their, you know, so-called um, Christian marriage or by these so-called Christian books that is going to make their relationship even worse. Cause that's, that's what I look back on and see what happened to me as I pursued these books desperately thinking these were going to be answers to help us. And it made it worse Yeah, because it reemphasized that message. And so that's why I do think your work is so powerful. And like we were all it talking is. about, it's so, it's so encouraging that the church is waking up to a lot of these things. And I know I love that, you know, the conversations are happening. So this latest book I hope to put into use in the future sometime. <laughs> so where can our <laughs> listeners buy your books and listen to your podcasts? Sure. Well, you can find me at to love, honor, and vacuum.com is the blog. The Bear Marriage Podcast is out every Thursday. And if you go to the blog and look under books, if you go on the menu and turn to books, you'll see the Great Sex Rescue. You'll see the Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex, the Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex. If you know any couple that is getting married this spring, give them those two books and help them start right. Yeah. Um, I, th- I hope they become the premarital books so that people, again, they just don't hear the negative messages because I think that would change our culture so much. But but yeah, just come to televonavacuum.com. You can look for Great Sex Rescue, Good Girl's Guide to Great Sex, Good Guy's Guide to Great Sex, anywhere the books are sold. And I love that you have even like a free, don't you have something with the great sex rescue that you can do like a, um, I don't know if it's a Bible study or something that you have on video. I watched part of it. I didn't watch the whole thing. Yeah. Time. Yeah. We have a free eight week study that Rebecca and I filmed. Um, so any groups that want to go through the book together, you can use that. Yeah, that's great. I just love all your resources and I love the, yeah, I love the work I you do because it is so important. So thank you so much for being on our podcast. Yeah. Thanks for being on the podcast. Well, thanks for having me again. I appreciate sure. it. All right. Thank you, Sheila. Yes, thank you.
the great sex rescue, you shared your research of 20,000 women that had a sexy, that ha- wait, <laughs> uh, let me redo that. <laughs> Let me do it again. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Thanks for tuning in to Hanging on to Hope. Check out our website, hangingontohope.org. There are resources on there. And if you would like to donate or volunteer, you can do that through our website. We are a brand new nonprofit, so we appreciate any and all support. And we thank you for listening. And until next time, keep hanging on to hope. We are evidence that there is hope and healing for you. And our passion is to help you find it too. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for listening, everyone. Bye.